There might be many people viewing online who are sort of used to thinking through a little bit of a different paradigm, you know, coming from a place, a different culture, um, one where we might just want to come down and get as much as we can. And uh, in a lot of ways, that, that's uh, driven some science, but, but scientists have always had it. Um, many scientists always had a deep reverence for the things that they're studying, whatever form that takes. And uh, we're doing our best to, to make sure we don't just come to take when we're here, but uh, coming as part of this and deeply connected to it. So thank you, Mahina, for sharing that. Yeah, of course. And in that case, um, th that's also effectively a double collection because we get the <laughs> specimen, <laughs> and one. yeah, we we get a we get a rock out of this too. So we minimize what we're disrupting with that kind of collection. Most definitely, yeah. Even just simple strategies like that, just trying to have multifunctional samples, samples that can be utilized by multiple scientists mm -hmm. um, for for various purposes. It's yeah. um, one Sometimes of the ways we get lucky and get one of those. Yeah. yeah. It's another one of the ways we show our respect and gratitude for being able to do this work in this really sacred place. Mm -hmm. Oh, our, our short team is uh, very pleased. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> We're glad. Ooh, look oh, at hey that, Patrick. Pa uh, yeah. He's a unit. Another. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I potential predation of That's that. a juicy unit. Yeah. <laughs> juicy unit. <laughs> juicy. I love these sea stars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're these predatory ones, but uh, sometimes they they just the take up these are. amazing poses, and I can't help but anthropomorphize it a little bit. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> funny. They're, they're, they're just great. <laughs> We have viewers wondering what our favorite islands in Hawaii are. And many of us have lifetime of experience in Hawaii. Others have uh, visited there several times. Many of us lived there for a long time. But any uh, any favorite islands? Can you pick a favorite? Kukui might be easy for you, or at least mm -hmm. a toss up between two. Moi no ko oi ois. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I knew you were going to represent Maui. Oh. Maui is on all of our hearts. It is uh, many, many people's favorite. And even if it's not, we all love Maui. <laughs> I haven't been to all of the islands, but I've been to a few of them. Um, spent the vast majority of my time on Oahu while I lived in Hawaii. But I have a major soft spot for Big Island. Yeah. Wow. It's just incredible. Moku Kiawe is something special and home of Pele. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Incredible moment. I'll get to see it. <laughs> yeah, oh, Robert. Something I've probably Ro done two, two dozen trips to Hawaii and I've only been on Oahu. No. <laughs> oh, wow. Robert, come on. Come on. <laughs> the man who's been everywhere in the deep sea, but uh, you get him up in yeah, air. I think I've been to every uh, Hawaiian island. <laughs> underwater. Including Luihi a bunch of times, which is an island, yeah. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I would love but to visit. Never set foot. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Wow. Aquaman up front. I would Robert love to Waters. visit Kamehameha <laughs> Kanaloa sometime. That would be magical. Can I ask why they um, changed the name from Loihi? Um, it, it better reflects uh, the the uh, uh, the volcano itself, and it was uh, this was something worked on, I believe, by the Hawaiian Cultural Working Group, right? I think What's so. The name yeah. of it now? And wasn't it already named? Uh, Kama Ihua Kanaloa. Uh, some, some folks uh, on Oahu at the university uh, uh, call it Kama Ehu for short. Huh. But yeah, it's, it's, it's more descriptive of uh, uh, how the volcano is. And I think reflects some of the mo'olelo and, and knowledge that Hawaiians have carried about. Uh, about the ways that um, Pele moves and, uh, mm -hmm. and the islands are growing. Yeah. What is your favorite island, Mana'o, Jan? 
Oh, oh my goodness. So hard, so hard to pick a favorite. Um, you know, I think uh, when I when I found out I was going to be a father, I, I brought uh, brought my wife and we met our family um, on Kauai and uh, and traveled to to Hilo um, on Mokokeave on the on Hawaii Island, the Big Island, and uh, so. Those two Mokupuni are very special to me, um, but now I've called Oahu home for the last almost eight years, and um, it definitely is, you know, I feel like I know it. I know it the best a little bit differently, and so hard to pick um, all of the other islands, too. I had my first trip to Lanai, Lanai was uh, just recently, and a very special place. I have yet to go to Ko'olawe, but look forward to the day that I'll get to um, visit that sacred island of Kanaloa as it uh, as it heals. And, uh, yeah, it's tough to say. Okay, so some background on the name change. Uh, former name, uh, Luihi, was introduced in 1955 by Dr. Kenneth O. Emery following a four-day bathymetric survey, 1954 off the south coast of the island of Hawaii. The survey was done at the request of the Office of Naval Research and five seamounts were identified. Um, let's see. And uh, skipping a little down this article, uh, Kamaehua Kanaloa's previous name was descriptive but failed to reflect Hawaiian cultural knowledge. Several mele orally passed down and documented in writing decades before the 1954 expedition described Kamaehua Kanaloa, an undersea volcano as explained by Ku'ule, uh, Ku'ule Kanahele of the uh, Edith uh, Kanaka'ole Foundation, Kamehua Kanaloa, quote, is a powerful name that invokes the name of uh, Pele Hunuamea and her birth out of Kanaloa. And the new name was uh, unanimously adopted in July 2021 by the Hawaii Board on Geographic Names. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks for giving us that background. Yeah. Oh, hello, Dr. Yeah. yeah. I have to agree with you, Dan, though. I mean, you know, our mo'oku'au our Hawaiian genealogy, it speaks of all of the islands being birthed to um, as children. And a bit of an overhang, yeah. And I see them all with very different personalities and souls. Back up for a minute. And so it's hard, and even when some people compare island to island, <laughs> I mean, I feel some kind of internal conflict because I see them as individuals yeah. with their own identity. Um, and you know, everyone, especially, everyone has their own, or are entitled to, to their own opinions. But I think like we each have a Pilina connection or a relationship to multiple different islands um, based on our own experiences, based on the experiences of our Kupuna, our ancestors. My ancestral line lineage uh, traces back to Kohala, North Kohala and Mokuokeave on the island of Hawaii. Um, and most of my Ohana, is on Kauai or Molokai. So I have a pilina in my own life with those places, visiting family, um, watching my nieces and nephews grow up there, visiting my tutu. So I think we all have places that are dear to us and then we all hold home in different spaces. Mm. It's almost like asking uh, which 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 child is your favorite? Which cousin? Yeah. Which cousin is your favorite? You yeah. you sort of have one, but you can't really say because you, you love them all so much. Most definitely. You love them all yeah. so much. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I love that. Thinking about uh, the Kopuna Islands, which we're in the waters surrounding our Kopuna Islands now, and and uh, thinking of this, these baby islands, these Keiki Islands that we call home. Sometimes yeah. we call Maine Hawaiian Islands, but uh, this is. Uh, they're all incredible gifts, all born from, from Pele's incredible trek across the seafloor here that we've been mm -hmm. so fortunate to follow. Yeah, she was um, quite the traveler, she still <laughs> is. Amazing voyager, yeah, Pele, I love reading about the uh, the stories of those voyages. Yeah, yeah. The How the she and her brothers and her family traveled through each each island. Yeah. Moving toward, uh, moving toward Big Island. So dramatic those stories. Uh, so many different twists and turns. So much, right. uh, so many conflicts. Uh, Very much so. You know, it's a, it was an incredible, incredible journey that Pele took, and uh, many, 
many people, I think, uh, you know, see, many Hawaiians see life as some, in some ways a progression from, from Kanaka and then back into Aumokua and Akua and, and uh, man, would have loved to have seen Pele as a Kanaka, as a Wahine, mm -hmm. uh, standing so tall and strong and just only to imagine as a, a voyager through these islands. Is no, just she's incredible. at home right now. Yeah. And I believe sometimes people actually, there is a legend on Mokokeawe that um, you can still see her walking along the road. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a friend whose father's friend um, probably saw her. Um, but it, there's a legend where you, when you see a, a lady with, with white hair locking, walking along the road and you offer her a ride, she'll come with you and she'll yeah. sit with you, talk with you for a while and then she'll, she'll go away. You don't have to let her out or anything. She'll just leave your vehicle. Yeah. yeah. That's just got chicken I've heard skin, of that Mo'olelo. Yeah, I've heard of that Mo'olelo, but on all islands, for a lot of different islands, one of our friends, I mean, yeah, to see a, a woman in white with white hair, an older kupuna, or like um, a woman with like a small dog. And so I feel like even now she just has many different forms. Um, yeah, many Absolutely. different forms. Wow, that's kind of spooky. I'm getting goosebumps over oh, here. Oh, I love it. Me too. We call her Tutu Pele. Tutu is our, Tutu Pele. It's our term for, for grandmother, grandfather, and uh, our elders. And um, Tutu Pele is uh, always, always present. Mm -hmm. Oh, Val, we have uh, some folks who really want to know what can we learn from the rock samples that we're taking from this area. We've talked, we've spoken a little bit about it, but uh, when we have a chance, if you want to go into more more sure. depth on what we're hoping to learn, it'd be great. Yeah, more of the green uh, stolons, I think, there too. Oh, I think that's just a... Oh, that might be a black coral. That's a black coral, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My bad. Uh, no, I think there are some there. Um, I think those are the white stolen friends that are pretty common. Yeah. Let's see if I can land right here. Uh, yeah, so what we're, uh, we're going to learn from the rocks is uh, what this... Uh, what the origins of the seamount are. So uh, um, what we're going to do is uh, uh, we're going to take uh, portions of these rock samples that we collect and send them over to a lab that can uh, do age determinations and figure out exactly how old these rocks are. And uh, we're also going to send other pieces to a lab that can uh, uh, look at the uh, geochemistry and the isotopic compositions of these rocks and determine what kind of mantle uh, uh, melted to produce these volcanoes. And uh, uh, from there, we can tell if these are related to a mantle plume or not, and which mantle plume. Oh, because uh, we're in an area where uh, two mantle plumes came, uh, uh, so were on here. intersected. Yeah. yeah. So basically, uh, the Pacific plate is always can moving. Zoom, can we get a zoom as we're flying? Yeah. yeah. Just trying to find a good place to sit. Thank you. Just looking for the branching structure, and this is um, it's an interesting looking. It looks like a paragorgia. Um, you know, I, yeah, it looks like oh, a paragorgia yeah. underneath it, and there's a primnoid there, I think. Um, it's my droids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very could be one of one of several. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, um, the Pacific Plate is, is always moving. Um, and uh, as it moves, there are these uh, uh, thermochemical anomalies in the mantle where uh, we think material is convecting uh, upward from a uh, place much deeper inside the Earth. And uh, that will produce these trails of volcanoes that get progressively older in the direction that uh, the Pacific Plate is moving. And uh, where we are right now, that's, that's happened two times 
in this portion of the Pacific's plate history, uh, Pacific plates history. So um, about in this area, roughly, we think about 90 to 80 million years ago, Pacific plate moved over uh, one hot spot that's currently uh, found well south of us uh, and a little to the east. Um, and then uh, about 25 to 30 million years ago or so, uh, this part of the Pacific plate moved over the Hawaiian hotspot. And we're right about at the intersection of those two hotspot tracks, those two trails of volcanoes left. And uh, we're, uh, we're hoping to learn okay. uh, which one this volcano was, uh, was generated by. So exciting. It's also, you know, I mean, over a span of many millions of years, but the Pacific Plate just uh, hung what my cousin John likes to call a Louis, a, le a strong left turn. It was heading south, and then all of a sudden, uh, the Hawaiian, the Pacific Plate, while it moved over the Hawaiian hotspot, was uh, traveling more to the east. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of wild to think a massive tectonic plate, Pacific Basin, just changing directions. <laughs> yeah, and it's done that a few times in its history. And that's so cool. And uh, the the Hawaiian Bend about 50 million years ago, which is a little bit further northwest of where we are now, um, is actually thought to be not just a change in uh, the direction of the Pacific plate motion, but also we think that um, it was accentuated by movement of the Hawaiian plume itself. Oh, wow. So um, prior to that bend, it may have been that the Hawaiian plume was moving south pretty rapidly, kind of mm -hmm. just blowing over in uh, the so-called mantle wind, yeah. and uh, then it may have stopped. Oh, interesting. Very cool. Because we, we've been comparing it to uh, the shapes of other long-lived hotspot tracks in other parts of the Pacific, and they don't quite match up. There's also some research uh, on the uh, Emperor Seamounts where uh, 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 the drill ship uh, Joides Resolution has gone and taken some uh, uh, core samples. And those have been used to get um, uh, using uh, magnetic data embedded in the rocks, uh, some paleo latitudes that seem to show based on magnetic alignment of uh, uh, like magnetites and stuff found in these lavas. You can actually record latitude in these. No way. Wow. It's like it's moved uh, south a little bit over time. That's wow. incredible. Yeah. Even the even the Pacific Plate is voyaging. Yes. Uh, and it's you know I love uh, you know like glacier ice. I'm always wow it's moving so slow and then to think well <laughs> this has been over hundreds of million year, hundred million years this journey that this Pacific Plate has taken over these two hot spots and yeah. and even the hot spots themselves sometimes shifting. You know, making adjustments and yeah. really incredible. And the oldest part of the part of the uh, Pacific Plate, um, it's a little bit north-ish, not not very much further north. And uh, over in the Western Pacific, uh, it's a little over 180 million years thereabouts. Incredible. Uh, into the Jurassic, and it's just this little triangle of. Uh, oceanic crust that's just really really old <laughs> that's so cool so i hope uh for those who were asking that question i hope you had your notebooks out you were taking some notes we can get uh age determination uh, some of the labs that will process our samples will help us determine just how old these rock samples are we can also study their isotopic signatures is signature is the right word for that yep. and uh, that that gives us a sense of the mantle plume the specific mantle plume that they can be associated with and then um, it, my mind is blown that we can also uh, determine determine latitude, mental latitude, from some of the magnetic properties in the in the rock as well. It's just wow. uh, so much information, so many isotope stories. Yeah. Books coming out probably 2035. You can pre-order now. <laughs> so, some of which are, uh, you know, confirming the stories that Hawaiians have known for thousands of years. I love it when the science catches up to the. Uh, to the science, to the original science. <laughs> it's awesome. I uh, want to give a shout out to one of my f uh, fellow science communication fellows, also named Daniel, Daniel Price. Uh, Daniel's an awesome fellow on board uh, earlier expedition this season and uh, really enjoyed getting to know him and meet him at the expedition planning meetings back in Rhode Island in March is where I met Val as well. And uh, yeah, Daniel, hope you're doing well. We're having a great time out here and uh, carrying on continuing the good work you helped us get started a few months ago. Could we get a zoom on this bunch? Yeah. It's okay if not. It's a little bit different, but it's um, yeah. pretty good. Let me get over there. Yeah, 
I'm noticing along this uh, saddle point here, we're starting to see more uh, sea start predation as well. Hungry sea stars on the saddle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daniel was uh, a geology major at West Virginia. Oh, and, cool. I uh, was working for the National Park Service. And, uh, yeah, I think he, he could have a bright uh, future ahead of him as a, as a marine geologist as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, Can I get a zoom? Beautiful. Wow. Yeah, look at that structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting structure. It's very regular. Is that a worm in the center of it? Or what yeah. Is that? yeah, I was wondering. Yeah. And actually, it looks like there's um, a coral growing. Right out the middle. In or through it, too. I don't think I've ever seen a worm quite like that before. Uh, oh, it's on the move. I think yeah. it's a, you can see kind of the bristles on the side of it. It's a kind of a polychaete yeah. worm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Polychaetes are awesome. I love polychaetes, polychaetes are fairly common. They're just, uh, honestly, they just hide a lot better than this one usually. Yeah. Um, so I'm most familiar with the so-called Christmas tree worms. Oh, oh yeah. I saw a few of those while diving in Curacao. Yeah. Very distinctive. <laughs> yeah, those are really funny looking. Oh, they're great. I mean beautiful, sorry, Christmas no, they, tree No, they're, they're funny. Christmas they can be tree. funny looking. They can be beautiful <laughs> all the same. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they're, they're a very different form than this kind of polychaete we're looking at right now. Yeah, very different. This almost has a similar morphology to a, to a fireworm, except I don't really see a round, like, segmented. But fireworms are my favorite kind of worm. Oh, oh really? To be honest, yeah. What makes them your favorite? I did my thesis project on them. Ah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that is a beautiful sponge. Um, very distinct um, water movement system as well, which is pretty interesting. I'm gonna take a rough, rough guess and say that it's uh, hexantelin, possibly euplectelidae. Oh, I see what you're looking at. Yeah. I do, I do think it's definitely okay, a glass wide. sponge, and actually, it does look like there's a couple yeah. euclectelid, um, especially in, um, that yeah. look very similar. So All right, zoom out. Video's going away. Fantastic, thank you so much. Almost yeah, perfectly guys. spaced circles, it's, it's really mm. architects, these glass sponges. How Amazing. do they do it, man? Amazing. I mean, they've been creating their shapes and structures for, I mean, they're some of the earliest Yeah, organisms. and that's, that's all genetically so. encoded. Is that an upside down anemone? Yeah, it sure is. Right, around, right underneath the sponge. Oh, yeah, that's funny. It looks like it's on, a, on the stalk of that. Yeah, it does. So thankful to be on this exploration with all of you in the control van and everyone tuning in with us online, fellow deep sea travelers. Amazing. Currently unnamed, but hopefully soon to be named, gifted with a beautiful Hawaiian name, Seamount 11. And, uh, we're tracking just a little bit south, I think, from Seamount 17, oh, wow. where we were the other day. Are these, these are slightly different from the other corals that we, whoa. Look at all of them down here, too. Whoa. Wow. Yeah, we definitely need to get a zoom on at least yeah. one of these. Of Are we getting back into oh my a goodness. forest? We're back in a coral forest, yeah. Oh, hey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my oh, goodness. Asako, we said the magic oh, words. Oh, oh, hey. yeah. yeah. Wow, and it just keeps going. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, if you, if, uh, yeah, if you get a good spot, 
to get a zoom. I don't think you're going to be able to get a purchase on anything. Oh, no. It's not. Oh, it's wow. To get it just continues. Too. Oh, my gosh. You oh can gosh. see how far it goes in, in um, Atalanta, too. It goes Fairly very, wow. very deep, it's steep drop off. Going on. Yeah. Let me get a little closer. Now. Yeah, this is yeah. really murky here, Zach. If you uh, have a look uh, at the topo maps or even the view from the Atlanta cam, you can see that it just falls off. The density here is. Yeah, you've got at least two types. See yeah. right there. Yeah. Any any of these okay. um, in through here would be great. Yeah, we're almost done with the move, so. I okay. Okay. Take awesome. I mean, yeah. we've got. I think we've got some time to get a, a zoom on yeah. any of these, so. Amber, These can are I get just a zoom? stunning. Sure. And this is a good place to be a sea star. <laughs> <laughs> Feast. Good place to be yeah. a coral. That too. It's like the Nautilus mess. <laughs> oh, and there's the bathopathies below it. These are amazing. Ko'a ohe nui, ya. Ai, oya i ono. Momona ke ia wahi i ka ke ko'a ohe. Rich because yeah. of this bamboo yeah. coral. Ohe in Hawaiian is bamboo. Yeah, these are bamboos. Ohe. And it looks like they are branching from the node. From the node. Oh, wonderful. And they're pretty planar. Or on multiple planes. No. It's hard to tell if I'm looking at one one bamboo or multiple bamboos. So. <laughs> I and mean, it's interesting because yeah. there's it seems like there's some smaller species of corals below them, like we saw bathopathies. There's also this sponge. Um, I think I saw something slightly pink below as well. This is this is pretty astonishing. Zoom out a little bit. Oh my goodness. And you said there was something else you want to look at below it? Um Yeah, actually, if we could get, it looks like um, if we could get a look at one of the stalks, sort of, to see the branching structure from the base. How about that one? That would be in the middle. Um, pretty cool. It seems like it might be difficult to do, though. Yeah, this one looks like an internodal branching, right next to your nodal branching uh, <laughs> coral. It's just like it's hard to tell. There are also some that seem to they're undetermined branching. Um, so it might be... Can you get zoom? Wow. Yeah, this is a lot like the hemichorallium dive in, in some ways in that we're just seeing an absolute dominance of one particular... Yeah. Well, okay. One, one broadly particular type of uh, uh, yeah. coral. So I'm seeing the, the br these branches are from the nodes again. Um, it seems pretty planar. This is really interesting, though. Because um, it, it almost looks like from the base they, they grow larger and not quite planar, but actually I think we're seeing... Uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, this is a nearly vertical-looking cliff face, if right. I've got the angle correct in Atalanta and there's cam. there's some barnacles on that one, and... Um, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah, we're stunning. just looking down that ridge. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Thank Th you. Thank you, Navigator. Yeah. Thank you, Pilots. Mm -hmm. Video yeah. Engineer. Mahalo, Front Row. Yeah, thank Beautiful you so much. This thank is, you. It's, it's amazing to see this. And also, you know, you know that when you see something when you see corals in this density, there's a reason, and usually it's currents, which makes it more difficult to get this kind of view on them as well. So, much mm -hmm. appreciated. Yep, no problem. That's so extensive here. Zach Gonzalez, everybody getting his hours as Herc Pilot. Got some fans doing an amazing job. That's what happens when you sit next to the to the OG. <laughs> sure is. <laughs> Old guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Not at all, Robert. <laughs> 31 is not old, my friend. <laughs> Amazing what you've packed into just He's so little me. years. <laughs> Yeah, and you just drop wow. down a meter or two and the water gets clearer again. Yeah. Amazing. It's it's such an abrupt change. That's so crazy. It's actually the current taking me right now. Oh yeah. The current is pushing you down? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. This is actually kind of sharp. We've, we've had some downward facing currents at various parts of this dive. Oh, I mean, it's it's not unheard of. There's all sorts of reasons. Um, What's that? that sort of no so well we are going we're meant to be going down this way so more this way but it's pulling us this way um if you're if you're ready i can get us to pull back this way a little bit okay okay current wants us to go back into the depths yeah dive deep Come back, take a breath, mm -hmm. dive so deep. Amazing. Beautiful Oli, composed to describe last expedition season's many expeditions into Papahanaumokuakea. And uh, Hoku, our colleague and friend, mm -hmm. teacher, if you're listening, mm -hmm. so beautiful. Describing the many d dives into the depths and return to the surface that Hercules makes, but also that all of us make when we come into this control van and then are changed by the experience diving into the depths and, and reemerge. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in the in the middle of the day at noon when our morning watch ends, and sometimes in the middle of the night with the stars above us, um, or the Hoaka moon last night disappearing at sunset. Yeah, how yeah. was the view last night? Those stars were nice. They came out yeah. to say hello. Yes, yeah, nice. I thought he could have it. He's like, is it really bad? <laughs> there was just a very special um, ho'okuku yeah. from Zach to, Zach to Robert. He got a cookie. Oh, cookie. <laughs> oh, very wonderful. I had the cookie over there. He's like, <laughs> he's looking at it. And I was like, do you want it? And he's like, can I have it? <laughs> <laughs> He just wants to practice his hole, ole lo Hawaii. Yeah. Cookie, cookie. <laughs> <laughs> we have too much fun in here, 8 to 12. Wouldn't have it any other way. That is a beautiful whole kupu. Catalina practicing her ole lo Hawaii as well. Yes. Awesome. Maika Ino. Yeah. Maika Ino. Very good. We have uh, at least a few, a handful of languages spoken on board the Nautilus on a pretty regular basis. It's a lot of fun watching people converse in Espanol, in Russian, mm -hmm. in English, in Hawaiian, all mm -hmm. yeah. in pirate. Yeah, pirate. <laughs> its own language, yes. <laughs> It is, yeah. I think Google Translate, you can translate things into pirate. I believe you can. Yeah. At least for a while there, Google had a beatbox thing. <laughs> That's uh, right. That's dr right. It was derived out of the uh, the German uh, the German part of its uh, translation service. Yeah. I don't know if it still does it, though. That was a long time ago when that went viral. Interesting. Didn't they do uh, Elvish from Lord of the Rings for a little bit, too? <laughs> <laughs> I think they did, yeah. Elvish. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think that high density of coral of uh, bamboos might be just above us a meter or so as well. Oh, and, and right there like too. Into it. Yeah. Back up a little bit that is giant. Another unit. <laughs> Amazing watching as Nautilus on one side of the saddle, us uh, hanging out on the other side. Watching our team work together to give us this incredible view. Yeah, you can you can see the high density in the Atalanta as well. Mm hmm And in the still cam.
so many different kinds of different forms of sponges we're seeing. A few different varieties of coral. This is just a another beautiful huakai. Or huakai. Hua. That's sponge, yeah. I, yeah, I. Huakai. Hey, huakai, huakai, kei, yeah? Hey, <laughs> yeah. Huakai. Pololei. Okay. It's that murky water again. Yep. That very abrupt transition. We may need to watch our back with Atalanta. We're kind of backing into a little bit of a the ridge. rock face there, yeah. 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 I'm about to turn around and go towards you right now. You know. Oh. Just uh, a lot further than I thought. Just hanging over the yeah, side of a cliff. That. No, you're fine. All right, let me turn back around. Head to right. him. Yeah, just gonna reposition the ROVs a little bit, so it'll get a little murky here for a minute or two. Catalina, our navigator, keeping an eye on the sonar. Yeah. Um, helping, helping make sure we don't. Uh, sorry, yeah, that we're we're pretty close there. May want to pull up when we can. Yeah. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. Keeping our ROV safe. Doing a great job in the front row. I see that ridge right there. Yeah. All right. So once once we're repositioned and uh, 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 feeling pretty good about uh, uh, where we uh, what we're doing, uh, we're kind of thinking in the back row here. Another eDNA would be good. This is a very very dense community. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, uh, not till we're uh, ready. Sounds good. Cool beans. Amazing cliff face. Yeah, thanks for giving that uh, us that incredible view of this uh, steep slope. Lots of different inputs guiding our ROV pilots and navigators as they put us in the best position to explore safely. Got sonar on both Hercules and Atlanta. And, uh, managing the tether length, the elevation, what we're seeing on the camera screen, actually multiple multiple camera views, not just what you can see, but others as well. So much to attend to, mm -hmm. just like on the va oh. It's awesome. That is very steep. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a cool shot, huh? It is. An Atalanta view, if you're not looking at it, is so shows her coming up this steep face. Yeah, and actually once we clear this, we're gonna be making a, like a left to go continue up. We were basically at the saddle point now. We'll just continue up this ridge now. Ooh, Ooh. Ooh. hello. Wow. There's some Napa Branked. Puhi? Puhi. Puhi. Yeah. Wow, look at Atalanta view. Gorgeous. Naniloa. I think we're seeing a couple of large polyopagons here, among other things. Yeah, it's the same corals. 
Is that a jelly right here? What is that? Is that a sponge? Oh, it's a, sp <laughs> it's a talk sponge. <laughs> I just saw it floating. <laughs> oh, no worries. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's got a really long stalk. So I think this mm -hmm. is what Zach was looking at. Yeah. I didn't see the stalk behind it also. It was just the sponge. <laughs> no worries. You've got that crinoid there kind of obfuscating it a little bit. So for the eDNA sample, I don't know if we're already too far removed. Um, is um, this, would you still want to do it? I think I think let's stand by on that for a little bit. Okay. Okay. Oops. Yeah, so this looks like a like a sheet flow here. It's pretty broken up. Oh, we've got another Chrysler Orchard there on the left. Oh, the sure enough, Apollo yeah. Pagan. Yeah, once again, a uh, very drastic change in what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a wrap out. Okay. So we're uh, crossing the saddle point right now on our way to waypoint seven. And then, Zach, we're going to be kind of coming this way. Okay. Yeah, Zach is still in the driver's seat of Herc, which is excellent. Bob grace me. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep feeding them cookies. So this looks like a little field of some debris, some rubble that's come down from uh, the slope that we're going to start going up. It's uh, giving some uh, uh, some nice tall spots for some of these corals to uh, get right into the current where, every, where all that good food is. Catalina, question about positioning of the ROVs relative to Nautilus. Is, is it pretty much that we always want to have them just off the stern, kind of close to where they're put down by the A-frame, but a little bit back behind the ship? Um, I, I, that's when they come down, but I mean, actually, they, it can vary quite a bit. It can get, you know, pretty, like, I guess, lateral, far off laterally and... I guess just depending on the heading of the ship and which way we're moving, like it can even be that like we're off the um, off the beam and stuff. Yeah. So 
Yeah. Maybe maybe somewhat dependent on surface conditions and what mm -hmm. the ship wants to do to kind of minimize yes. roll. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. What's that? We just passed something uh, that looked a little bit different, something pink, and if possible, we, it would be great to get a zoom. Oh on, yeah. On this here, Kukui noticed it. So uh, Primnoid or Victor Gorgia or something. It's kind of purple. Be, yeah, any number of things. It's got that little bit of purple that we always like to see. <laughs> One of the rarest colors in nature, actually, purple. Is it really? Yeah. Amazing. I thought blue was. was yeah. It blue? Yeah, blue, blue doesn't yeah. entirely exist in nature. Yeah. There, there's like a whole, a whole wild history of like how different cultures perceive shades of blue too. Mm. Like that can that can be a cultural a thing. Blob. I remember being in Antarctica and on other glaciers too, the, the blue of the ice yeah. is always amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, some of those other uh, ice uh, phases. As air gets, I think, compressed out of those bubbles. And, and yeah, and they, it's, it's also like a, like a distinct phase, like there's ice two, three, yeah. four, yeah, yeah. They're all different uh, pressure, temperature, uh, stability fields. It's kind of wild. Let's get up a little bit actually. One of the few folks in Hawaii, I think, who absolutely loves the cold. <laughs> you said you went to Antarctica? Hold on. I did, yeah. I was able to visit uh, the Antarctic Peninsula on expedition a few years ago now, back in 2018. God, that's got to uh, be incredible. I would. Uh, Antarctica sounds like such a wonderful place to visit. Some active volcanic activity. Oh, yeah, Mount Erebus. Yeah. I, my PhD advisor went there and uh, got some uh, crystals. Oh, cool. uh, from uh, Erebus, some of the uh, the large uh, feldspars that it erupts. Wow, so cool. Awesome. Do you want to take the lasers off real quick so we can focus oh, yeah, on Yeah, this the is follows? really different from what we've been seeing. Beautiful. That is not a Victor Gorgia. That is Gorgia. wild looking. Uh, All the polyps are retracted though. Yeah, I was going with Chrysogorgia. Um, because it's so delicate and fragile. I'm seeing a black skeleton though. Uh, they. They have that sort of, the, these are not um, black right. coral. Um, they don't uh, look yeah. like black coral. They don't look no. like black coral polyps. Um, that, that skeleton is actually um, indicative of the Chrysogorgia as well. It's just yeah. often you can't see it. And it does have that ophiroid as well. Um, it looks like the polyps are retracted into very cute little bubbles. Kind of reminds me of like cherry blossoms in the spring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially around Maryland. And, yeah. And, yeah, we uh, get a lot of that DC in the spring. Area. Like the ones in uh, D.C., it's this huge deal when they bloom and tourists from all over the world come to see them. That's that. uh, very common. I think the cherry blossoms there are from uh, Japan. And, yeah. Uh, so they they also, the cherry blossom blooming in Japan is also a very important um, yeah, tourist attraction for locals as well as people trying from I know that Kyoto in the mm -hmm. spring when those bloom is uh, packed full of visitors as well, yeah. Absolutely, so. yeah. Beautiful. That's amazing. Is this, yeah, that's pretty, this is a pretty cool little Chrysogorgia. Um, uh, can we pan down a little bit to see the base of it? I'm having yeah. a hard time getting an idea of the overall shape again. Okay. It's like one, one set of polyps <laughs> out. <laughs> Maybe two. That's fantastic, yeah. This one's a little shy. Yes, yeah. Unfortunately, I think Chrysogorgia has, um, the nomenclature has changed somewhat. Uh, of the, the genera's have changed um, and have been moved around, so I can't make an ID because I'm not familiar with the new system, but it's, uh, Chrysogorgias are some of my absolute favorites to see. So when did that classification change? Mm. Uh, you know, I don't know. I just know that um, um, it is it, it is different from what's in the ID guide. Okay. Um, so it's been within the last few years or so? Yeah, the last few years. Um, That's pretty recent. Yeah, I think uh, basically I was just looking at us. I was calling something something else uh, that was no longer correct yesterday, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. It happens. This is science is changing things regularly. Yeah. That's yeah, bet, and know. it revises itself as uh, we learn more and more. So. Right. It just, uh, I never want to, I, while I do give incorrect information sometimes, I, I like to not do that.
Yeah, but it is that definitely a Chrysogorgia, um, a Chrysogorgid, so that's awesome. All right, thanks for the zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is wonderful. It's got a pretty distinct shape to it, which is kind of interesting. We're coming toward the end of this uh, saddle point here, so we'll start moving uphill again. What did you call this? It um, uh, looked like a sheet flow to sheet me. Sheet flow, yes. Yeah. That looks like an old sponge that was. Wow. It's big. Yeah, it's massive. Oh, and it uh, looks like another bathopathies. Wow, that sponge yeah. is... That is <laughs> large. Large. Oh, can we get the laser lights back on? I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I just asked for them off. <laughs> wow. Jeez. And look at, the, look at the sea stars just dwarfed by just how massive the sponge is. <laughs> We might have some uh, secondary associates there too. Oh Looks yeah. Like maybe, maybe potentially more of those Xenophyophores you know, or something completely different. I think I could live in that thing. It's like half the size of Herc. <laughs> yeah. In the Atlantic Yeah. Oh amazing. yeah. If you look at Atlanta, <laughs> it is. Wow. That yeah. That at gives least you a really quarter. good. At least a quarter. Maybe a third. A really good sense of scale there. Oh like no, maybe a Walteria skeleton there, yeah, too. Yeah, Walteria. We've got um, a small urchin. We've got yeah. several brittle stars. Looks like some living sponges that are taking up some of the crevices here. I wonder, can the living sponges sort of take some of the material of these dying sponges and, and sort of repurpose that? I don't know. I mean, spicules are made of, uh, what, silica? And mm -hmm. um, so it, it could be that they're able to utilize some of the silica, but I'm not hmm. sure how they would be able to access it. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Looks like we've got some uh, yellow things. Those urchins are pretty interesting. I've seen several of those before. I think we've seen several of them, maybe not on this dive, but on previous dives. Um, I forget which section they're in though um but they're they are so fun yeah they they remind me of the um aspidodiamatoida um and they've got these very intricate um long brand, uh arms i think they're arms on a Urchin. Oh, and a squat lobster. Yeah, it's a whole apartment building here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was a really nice zoom. Thanks. So we've got about an hour left in watch, and uh, we're well on our way to waypoint seven, so we'll probably hit that by about the end of watch. Maybe a little bit further uh, beyond it. <clears throat> uh, still plenty of dive left after that. So this is planned out as a 24 hour dive, so uh, uh, be uh, back up on deck this evening and processing some samples. So, um, this has been a really good one. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to see this dead sponge because, you know, when we think of 
of organisms that are dead. We think that they're no longer contributing to the community. But this is, you know, this is clearly a host to many different organisms, probably a, you know, um, uh, bacteria as well. And it's it's so interesting to see. I mean, there were probably yeah, yeah, this way. One, two, three, four. There are at least five different ta types of organisms on top of that sponge. Um, Makes me think of a tropical yeah. and temperate rainforest when Can a tree falls zoom down. On this, or are we moving? Do we need to move quickly? I think that's another one of those black corals we've been seeing. I think it is too, and I Probably think uh, Tina mentioned that she thought it was uh, in between two different types of corals. So I'd, I'd love yeah. to get another zoom on that if we can. Um, I thought it was a. Well, I've forgotten what I thought it was. Yes, I was just reminded by the dive plan that uh, Waypoint 6 is one of the local topographic highs on this very ridge-like uh, seamount. So we just passed that, and uh, the, the real summit is uh, still a couple hundred meters uh, higher. We are planning to uh, try to get there on this dive. We'll be at Waypoint 10. Yes, yeah, summit at a depth of uh, 1,460 meters. We're currently still at about 1730. Yeah, so just under 300 go. meters to go. Yeah. Lots to see. Nearly 1,000 feet. It's still it quite a climb. <laughs> it can be. Oh, it looks like there's something on top of it, too. Another crinoid. Uh, yeah, light-colored crinoid. Uh, there's a shrimp. shrimp. A little cup coral. Those oh, are, you've uh, got your yellow soliniferans. Yep. That makes yeah, those better. are those are still around. That's a good thing to see. So those may be more common than we think. They're just really they're really tough to spot. Again, brings in that question of bias and you know what we what we are and aren't able to see. And sometimes it's just because it blends in so well. But uh, yeah, this is the first seamount where I think I've seen stolen that, co that color. Yeah, so it'd be it's interesting, interesting to learn more about it. I'm not seeing on the stolen difference to the to the right that there's the the branch the line between them. Is this full zoom on this black coral? Uh, let's see, I got that's yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's excellent. Zoom. Thank you. It's um, you know, black corals the the polyp shape, and the is really important, and um, uh, as well as the branching structure. So I'm zoom out. Let me try to see if I can get a little bit closer. That's awesome. And once once we're done here, I uh, will uh, try to make some moves uphill. Keep uh, keep ourselves keep our timing good. Some fellow explorers wondering if we find sponges like this in shallower waters and uh, glass sponges. I I think are are unique to the Kai Uli to the deep sea, but we have uh, many many kinds of shallow water sponges from what I understand. Are your last sponges oh, okay. unique to the deep sea? I was not aware of that. That's pretty cool. I think oh, well, we should double check because sometimes. I remember pulling up sponges in like the estuaries on coastal Louisiana that had kind of spicules in it that were fiberglassy. Interesting. Yeah, it could be glass sponges then. Uh, greater than 300 meters almost exclusively. Oh, wow. Let's see if that's better. Can you zoom in? Okay. So it sounds like there might be a couple exceptions, but not too many. Yeah, four locations where glass sponges are found shallower than 50 meters. Antarctica, the amazing, beautiful fjords, one of my favorite places on Earth, of southern New Zealand, fjord land. Caves in the Mediterranean, and some of the coastal waters of the Northwest Pacific. Wow. They're all very different places. They are, but cold, most yeah. of them. Not, not necessarily the caves. I don't know how cold it gets in those Mediterranean caves, but... Yeah, this this uh, this black coral does look very visibly visually similar to the the um, Schizopathidae uh, staropathies. Um, that does not mean that's what it is, because a lot of corals you have to dig a little bit deeper to find out. But that's wonderful. Yeah, the um, that's a beautiful view. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh -huh. And Catalina, for our next move, can we do a little bit of a bigger hop? Sure. Awesome. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So 
try to get up to a little bit of a shallower depth and uh, see what might change there. I think that's another uh, one of those uh, fly trap. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, the Actinus yes. Yeah. Yes. What type Animal. of rocks are these again? Um, uh, hard to, hard to tell exactly. It looks like uh, fragments of some sheet flows, but I'm also seeing what might be a little bit of pillow morphology in those fragments. So just lava. Just lava. <laughs> <laughs> And, well, we got we may have a couple of types of lava flows in there. It's it's difficult to determine sometimes. <laughs> I'm seeing both fragments and maybe some stuff with some radial structure in it. So. Okay, yeah, this looks like a more massive uh, sheet flow around these parts. Spit out a wrap. Okay. Looks like we have a swimming uh, crinoid right there. Too fast. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's okay. We don't need to stop. <laughs> I was gonna just try to see the uh, yeah. flyby zoom. It, it's a uh, little hard to spot against uh, the sedimented uh, substrate, but I can also see that Robert's making some adjustments with the Atalanta, so yeah. definitely not a good place to stop. Catalina, maybe the sponges that you saw in Louisiana were boring sponges. Okay. I'm reading a little bit about them. Yeah. Yeah. They it, can does it say anything about like the little spicules? I'm still looking that up. It could, I could be mixing it up because we did also have deep sea samples. Oh. Could have been from those. Interesting. So these boring sponges, they just put little holes into the substrate where they're anchoring down? Oftentimes it's on like clams or other other shells oh. or oysters. And so when you find those shells with those nice little holes, holes in them, in them it little often, often created, at least on the Gulf Coast, I'm, I'm sure they're oh. common other places. But Do they have a kind of red color? Is that what you're seeing? Oh. I think I remember that now that you're saying that. I need images. Yeah, I see a reddish and a yellow okay. form. Yeah. In honor of Zach, I was looking it up at Texas Saltwater Fishing Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we really don't have any, really too many reefs over where I'm at. Like, I know they have the artificial ones, like, kind of, I think, I want to say 100 miles off from Galveston, I think. I don't yeah. remember. They're, they're, they they placed some artificial reefs out there somewhere, and I think now they're starting to slowly, steadily let people start fishing the area. Interesting. So, hmm. but I don't know what's out there. I haven't checked on them in a while, so that might be something kind gotcha. of cool to look into. I know the Oriskany was a aircraft carrier, I believe, aircraft carrier intentionally sunk off the off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Yeah. Uh, now it's becoming a popular uh, popular dive site. With, I think the bridge, I think the tower is right at around 100 meters. 
I've Does never it? I've never done it, but apparently the um, you can get some pretty incredible dives out of the under the oil rigs out. Really? Yeah, like they attract some pretty incredible like they're almost like little microcosms underneath them. You get these big fish and just stuff encrusting all over them. But they're, from what I understand, they're a little uh, risky just because currents can get pretty strong. But that yeah, makes sense. It's supposed to be pretty cool. Wow. Let's go. A lot of times companies don't even want you near them if you're Yeah, I'm not surprised. Because <laughs> uh, we used to go deep sea fishing and uh, over near near them, and like one of the captains we had, he always tell us that, you know, we get near certain rigs that they're a little bit more friendly. They don't really care, but they care, but they don't really care. Mm -hmm. And some of the other ones will immediately call Coast Guard to come chase you off mm. from the area. Wow, interesting. And I think it's like you're supposed to be within, what is it, like a 300 yards from them. Because I think they worry about tooling and the stuff getting thrown off the side of them. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, my gosh. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, seeing mainly sedimented substrate here. Uh, things are a little bit more sparse, but we're seeing some crinoids and uh, a couple different kinds of sponges. Walteria well, looks like uh, another one of those polyopagons or something similar. Um, some uh, yeah. sea stars. Yeah, we've been seeing several uh, bathypathies as well, and um, we've seen a lot of uh, dead Walteria with crinoids and ophiroids on them. Mm -hmm. um, and this in front of us is, I believe, a live polyopagon. Yeah, that looks alive. Um, Maybe some anemones here and there, too. Uh, several uh, ophiroids. Yeah, that's another. Chrysocorage, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so kind of a similar distribution of things. Well, variety of things, different distribution. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, actually, those chrys these chrysogorges we've seen, we haven't actually seen, I think, the okay. earlier in this dive. They're slightly different. These look rounded, very rounded. Okay. We've seen several, um, uh, what are they called? Brush? The bottle brush kind? Bottle brush. Um, we've seen several of those as well as some, I think, planar. Earlier in the dive, we saw planar um, chrysogorgia. I called it a pleurogorgia, but I think that's um, one of the... That's that's one of the genera that's been renamed. Um, okay. And I've since forgotten the, what it was renamed to. A teeny little sea star of some sort mm -hmm. that just went out of frame. Mm -hmm. Maybe one of those gony asteroids or something along those lines. Oh, I missed it. Virginia and oh, Kukui is uh, doing a touching base with the uh, Mokupa Papa Discovery Center, Papa Hana Mokuakea's Discovery Center in Hilo, along with Mahina and. I think they got Jacob in there too. Oh, Jacob! Yeah, oh. awesome. Jacob in there as well. Also, God, I love that place. It's such a cool little uh, like setup they have. Looks like we've got over there as well. It's a real, it's a real gift. But a question came in wondering about uh, our biological samples when we bring them to the surface. I know there's a, a pretty quick process to try to get those turned over mm -hmm. and kind of safely mm -hmm. put away so they can be well preserved but what's happening to those cells when they exp experience atmospheric pressure at the surface and the cells is that the question yeah oh interesting um so there's a lot of uh hmm you know i haven't really thought about it in a minute and i am um um but uh, a lot of these organisms are very well adapted to the seafloor, to slightly higher pressures, whether that be, um, you know, altering how their proteins are assembled, as well as, um, you know, just adapt adaptation to the temperature um, and the cold. Um, so I believe it, it can be a stressful time um, when, they, when they do get moved up to the, to the surface. Um, sometimes there is some, some uh, secretions um, uh, what we or or mucus that we see, um, especially on a lot of the bamboo corals, they oh, will they will excrete a lot of mucus. Um, but I am not looking at their cell structures um, specifically. To be fair, they actually do regularly look pretty healthy when you see them. You can still um, you can still see a lot of the morphology and. Um, uh, 
you can get um, one thing that people will do is they'll get to histology and so that's the process of fixing an organism uh, and fixing the cells so that you can look at things such as um, eggs reproduction is that's a really important portion for um, reproduction um, and so you can you can still see a lot of a lot of those key characteristics in the histology after you've brought organisms up from the depths. So I think while there is, um, I think the the cells themselves might still be okay based on the fact that that, that science is still um, able to go through. Yeah. Um, Amazing. I know the rock samples can sit for a bit longer before they, <laughs> before they get sliced. Uh, yeah, rocks don't really get the bends. Well, there are a couple of exceptions, but the ones that we're bringing up uh, don't get the bends. <laughs> there, there are examples of uh, some uh, uh, recently erupted mid-ocean ridge rocks that if you bring those up to the surface, they still have a lot of uh, uh, gas dissolved in them, uh -huh. and uh, that starts decompressing at the surface, and they will actually start popping. Just popping. And we also Pop creatively rocks. call them uh, popping rocks. Those are very important for um, uh, studies of volatiles of these kinds of melts because they they uh, because they've retained those gases. We can look at this yeah, we can study them and yep. uh, uh, get an idea of those those volatile loads and translate that back to uh, what the mantle source may look like uh, oh, wow. better than we can with uh, some of these much older altered rocks. Studying it's the gases of the popping rocks. Yeah, this yeah. sounds like another edition of nice, nice <laughs> type stories. I like it. Yeah, popping rocks are kind of fun to read about. They're uh, kind of a unique sampling opportunity because it's it's really hard to, you know, volatiles. They're going to do what they want. They're going to degas. They're yeah. going to uh, they're going to escape these these structures uh, every chance they get. So uh, in order to be able to study oh, wow. those, it's it's a really unique opportunity. I think people okay, okay, I think people often forget how powerful water, air, really are when yeah. they're uh, under pressure or moving or and uh, if gas is trapped inside a rock and, and needs to expand that rock that is, is gonna, yeah. gonna crack eventually gonna get it's interesting it. branching wow. structure yeah, there i'm actually just beautiful. thinking i haven't seen something like this in all in a while um there's a there's a schizopathid that i think will do that sort of branch um like that secondary branch um I think it's called a tel telopathies, but um, yeah, that's really interesting. And you can see the very delicate polyps coming off of those secondary branches. Um, yeah, yeah, which does make me think it might be within the schizopathid um, because of the size of the polyps, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that, you know, most of these black corals are very, they have very determinant branching. And so the fact that we do have the second branch here, as well as the, um, oh, thank you, perfect. So we have this, you have this split here, and that's pretty, all right. pretty distinct um, all with all those ophiroids as well. Awesome. Great. Thanks. For, thank you so much for that view. That's yeah, very nice interesting. Zoom. Yeah. Changing of the guards. All right. We're doing a pilot swap, and then we'll uh, get moving again. I've been demoted. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. You just <laughs> ran out of cookies. You are back, yeah. <laughs> hey, that was, some, that was some awesome flying, Zach. Nice work. <laughs> Thanks to both our pilots working as a team. <laughs> <laughs> so to the question about cell membranes, um, I'm doing a tiny little bit of digging here online, and uh, yeah, there, there does seem to be some evidence for um, uh, decompression rupturing some cell membranes, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for uh, bacteria. So I'm looking at microbiology oh, bacteria, articles. Oh, I have no yeah, idea about not, bacteria. Uh, this is a macro, but uh, it's, it's sending me down an interesting rabbit hole about um, uh, pressurized uh, bio uh, sampling vessels for things like this that uh, are going to be more capable of uh, uh, 
uh, keeping biological samples, organisms that we bring up for study uh, more intact once we bring them to the surface. So there, there are sampling methods that can get around that. And uh, presumably uh, these are uh, uh, pretty humane sampling methods as well, so they don't have to experience that decompression on the way up. Thank you, Val, for looking that up for us. Mm -hmm. For those tuning in online, we Nautilus Ocean Exploration Trust has just released two recent videos on Nautilus Live and on YouTube, one featuring this amazing collaboration between Ocean Exploration Trust and Papahanao Mokuakea, uh, featuring some of our shipmates, some of our crewmates, and then also another video, um, beautiful summary and uh, tribute to the dives we were able to do on board the USS Yorktown and the Akagi and Kaga, all sunken aircraft carriers of the Battle of Midway, World War II. So check those out. Um, yeah, you may start seeing that in the media at some point as well. It's a big story. It's an it important is. story. Uh, yeah, we uh, we found out that some parts of what we knew uh, need to be amended based on some of the new things that we saw, and uh, there there's some new stories that can finally be told about some of these wrecks that, um, uh, that we hadn't been able to prior. If we're here for a minute, we haven't seen this Primnoid, but if not, um, we can find another one to zoom in on. I think we could do we that. Can we go buy one? This Primnoid here. Okay. We got some time. Okay. Zoom in. Yeah, it's got many, many I'm polyps. Right now, here pretty tight. So, give me a second. Yeah. It's got polyps on the base, which is also important. Go. Be so does that indicate that it's a younger coral? I think it's uh, different Different corals will do that. I'm not okay. positive. Though. I could be so wrong. Primnoids <laughs> are not my species. Gotcha. Or, or family. Um, What's that guy? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, this is a little dude back here. Oh, yeah. That looks like it's on the coral, too. Um, yeah. That's oh, fantastic. It, it looks like we've floor. got a whirl Maybe of it's just four. Maybe it's Yeah, so yeah, we've got, we got more oh. zoom. Is that it? That's everything. Okay, that's awesome. So we've got a whirl of four. The bottom branches um, are also have uh, polyps on them, and then there's polyps on the stalk, and it looks like the polyps are slightly facing down, but maybe just facing outward. Um, and it is mostly so planar with some extra branches off of it. Thank you, that's, that's excellent. Um, you're full wide right now. Made pretty good time up this hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a little bit less going on here, so uh, makes sense to uh, uh, keep progressing upward, upward and onward. All right. Do some documentation on the fly. So yeah, I think it would be interesting to uh, make the true summit on this uh, by the end of the dive.
And we're pretty much uh, what look like sheet flows here. We want a very tall sponge. <laughs> oh, there's another one of those yellow bolosomas, the yellow stocked ones. Yeah, so interesting that we hadn't really seen those till uh, uh, this dive. Or a little zoom. bit further south. Yeah, we can do a quick zoom on that. Yeah, we were seeing some of these in the uh, Lilio Kalanis too. Is there a reason why it's turning yellow? What was that? I said, is there a reason why it's turning yellow? It, was, it looked like it was white once upon a time, and now it's all of a sudden it's yellow. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. No idea. Um, I've seen that it, it could just be that as it gets older, it could be a bacteria association. It could also just be that it changes color as it gets older. Yeah, it could just be yellow. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other, the it seemed like in the in the ID guide, um, the the smaller yellow bolosomas did not have yellow on their sponge, like on yeah, the on the stalk. They only the had stock. yellow on the stalk. Whereas the yellow bolosoma sponge that we saw earlier, which was larger, had yellow um, on the stock as well as on the the actual yeah. sponge. I'm pretty um, sure those also. are two two different species. Interesting. Don't quote me on that, but uh, I, I believe they were distinct. Yeah, the the fully yellow, like the entirely yellow ones, uh, tend to be quite large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be age. It could be a different species as well. Yeah. So how would you guys feel? Um, we've been doing like like 50 or so meter jumps. Do you guys want to try tracking a line or would you prefer the kind of jumps? Um, yeah, how about we track a line up, up toward waypoint seven um, okay. and then we'll see what's there and uh, keep moving it uphill. Okay. Yeah, it, it looks like it might be a little sparse for a while, but uh, you know, we, all, yeah. we know how quickly things can change on these yeah. uh, ridges too. So we're, we're actually just under 20 meters away from waypoint seven. So do you want to kind of just skirt right along it, like tracking uh, a line or what do you think? Yeah, let's, let's maybe do a 50 meter move. Okay, sounds good. Oh, okay, this is making some sense. Oxygen saturation is pretty low here. We're at about 11%. So it's been a little bit up and down the last few minutes. Uh, let's see, let me get a little bit more Oh yeah, we've gone down quite a bit in the last hour on oxygen saturation, so that kind of explains ah. in part why we're seeing a lot less uh, life in this area. Yeah, so, uh, before that, we were at about 13.5. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's a small difference. percent Yeah, and now we're down to 11. You don't have milligrams per liter, do you? Uh, I that's, don't. That's what I'm more familiar with than percentages. I don't think so. I think it's just uh, saturation percentage. Relates to a question coming in from one of our amazing deep sea travelers online, wondering about corals and sponges and uh, whether or not they require oxygen or a lot of oxygen to survive. And they definitely do require oxygen. And Dr. Val was just speculating that potentially that change in oxygen availability 
um, in these different locations on the seamount could it help explain why we might see more or less um, be some a part of explaining why we see more or less uh, diversity of life and abundance of life yeah and uh, we were seeing some of these variations last year and it did seem to you know not always but more or less correspond with uh, the density of the communities that we were seeing and uh, yeah we may we are obviously going through a very low density area right now which kind of uh, got my O2 uh, alarm ringing. <laughs> Is there, there are some depths uh, that um, our biology team has identified where there is a lot less dissolved oxygen in the water, um, and that, that can vary as we go through um, different uh, portions of dives at these depths. So, um, it, at some point, I if I'm not mistaken, it will go back up again. I just don't know by how much or exactly uh, what depth. My memory is a little fuzzy for that. For I'm sorry, are we talking about oxygen? Yeah. Still, um, yeah, oxygen minimum zones are pretty pretty common. They can they can be widespread. They're actually getting larger, which is unfortunate. Yeah, that's um, a problem. But the it's pretty it is it is pretty it's a pretty common natural phenomenon as well. Um, just due to the amount of um, uh, oxygen utilization by organisms in the shallower regions and and how wide that moves um, and the and the the use of and then the the use of um, oxygen by organisms that are um, eating the phytoplankton that are falling as well that can that can lead to these um, low oxygen zones. Um, mm -hmm. Honest problem, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Oxygen is a very important component of life that should that is uh, that changes pretty drastically even in the deep sea sometimes. So, but most of the deep sea, while somewhat lower in oxygen, does have um, does have enough for for organisms to survive in. Yeah, it's a it's a very important um, metabolic element. Life is definitely limited by oxygen. Yep. Availability. Yeah, we were Water seeing some chemosynthetic. Yeah, we were seeing some chemosynthetic uh, bacteria on the uh, shipwrecks, which. Uh, the uh, you mean the ones that are creating the rusticles? Yep. Yep. So we do see some different metabolic pathways, but uh, where we are right now, yeah, oxygen is definitely a key player in uh, the metabolisms the organisms we're seeing. Were you able to find a conversion? I think it might have to do with temperature as well. Oh, I was looking up. Uh, I was looking up uh, where the OMZs are. I, sorry, oh, not okay. a conversion. Yeah, um, I, was, I was trying to look it up, but I'm trying to. Yeah, you're yeah. you're logging. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Only because I know the the milligrams per liter. That's important yeah. for fish and 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 other organisms and. And I don't know if that percentage is is based with that. Uh, yeah. Percent dissolved oxygen to milligrams per liter. You just multiply the percentage by 1.33. So that's a pretty easy conversion. Oh, it looks like we've got some sort of jelly coming through. Oh, yeah. Might jelly or tinopore. Oh, I was using jelly as a gelatinous. Uh, the more general term. Uh, yes. No, that's, that's fine with me. The most of general terms. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm just kind of fascinated mm -hmm. with tenophores. I know absolutely nothing about them, except that they look cool. <laughs> yeah, it could be a tenophore. I'm seeing some some lines on it that resemble tenophores, but it could also be any number of... Oh, oh I'm seeing I can the, see the refraction right yep, down the end. there's refraction. That's a tenophore. Whoa. Oh, oh, you're so gorgeous. That's amazing. <laughs> absolutely stunning. Can we get the light, laser lights off while we look at this? Robert, could we? Oh, okay. No, Zach got it. Sorry. <laughs> Nothing. No, we're good. We're good. <laughs> awesome. That was really cool. Well, thanks all, and uh, thanks for turning those laser lights off. I can guess we, we can have them back on now. Them back on. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, we could, yeah. We could <laughs> that all, I mean, I mean. Not a bad idea. <laughs> But we like talking to you guys. <laughs> I don't know. I, I get a little leery of the idea of getting any sort of uh, uh, vehicle control to the back row. That, yeah. that's, that sounds, sounds like just dangerous. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Look what we can do. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, that would be an end to that yeah. real fast. <laughs> yeah, if, uh, if, the, if the pilots didn't fly by the, the same camera, we could, we could potentially do... Oh, we got a... What is that? I was put in control of uh, Sebastian's camera on Falcor uh, I liked for like that. lunch and afternoon relief. Mm -hmm. I was not good at that joystick. That is a very sensitive joystick. Oh, I thought it was wonderful, but it could have been different ones. Um, I thought, yeah. Uh, on on a uh, Falcor on on uh, Sebastian, they have a separate camera that their pilots fly by versus their science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 We're Robert's here, telling us uh, on this. there's a bit of a satellite delay on those cameras that can uh, complicate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice 4K camera setup. Um, much like we got here. And, uh, this is great. I think yeah. that's what we got here. Yeah. It's 4K, right, Amber? But this that we're looking at? Yeah. No, we're looking at 1080. Ah, 1080. Okay. Yeah. Are you all good? That's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we, we can move on. So I'm seeing some different uh, sort of shapes in these rocks. Are they are they are they different? Is this still uh, sheet flow or still kind of looks sheet flowy tree, to me? Oil? Um, but with well developed uh, botryoidal manganese crusts, uh, it's kind of being brought out by the sedimentation. There there may be some uh, pukas in the underlying rock too. Um, it's it's really hard to tell what exactly is going on with this, but it's sort of broadly just. Lots of lava. <laughs> Very sheet like. So, well, we might have more. We've got something else yellow there that might be the. Mm -hmm. Either the stolen or the hydroids. Yeah. Might be the stolen. I think I see some lines. Cool. Yeah, my rock brain is just going, nope, no rock here. <laughs> no rock pickup. <laughs> And if you were be able to bust anything off of here, which I wouldn't recommend, um, it would probably end up being all crust. And um, can you remind us, uh, all crust is not what you're looking for? Um, not specifically what I'm looking for, but um, that, that could uh, uh, potentially be helpful for uh, some folks at USGS who are specializing in manganese crust. But Usually, when I'm trying to subsample for them, I uh, try to include some of the rock too, so they uh, so they know that they have that complete uh, uh, sequence, uh, that complete growth sequence. Right, because you're interested oh. in the isotopes, which are the chemical ratios between different um, uh, components of the rock that change uh, with age. Correct. Sort of, and yeah. So, so it's it's different masses of the same element, um, the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons, um, and uh, uh, certain uh, certain isotopes are sensitive to uh, radioactive decay of other elements that decay into those. So we get this uh, time integrated change in uh, these ratios. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, makes it a really good tool for. Uh, 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 finding a uh, mantle that's been subjected to different yeah. kinds of histories over long periods of time that's then been, you know, some of it may have once been at uh, Earth's surface, part of the crustal system, and then it's been recycled back into the mantle. Okay. And uh, it has some of these modified parent-daughter ratios that cause it to ingrowth to different uh, compositions over time. There, there are several different uh, kinds of mantle that uh, can develop this way. As well as some stuff that might be uh, like ambient mantle that's just kind of like average compositions, some stuff that might be really, really old that's been uh, isolated deep within the Earth system for 
basically its entire history. So, uh, you know, things that look like mid-ocean ridge, things that look like recycled crust, things that look like recycled, potentially pelagic sediments or lithosphere, stuff that looks like maybe recycled continental crust. So, so all things that we learn how to tell apart based on uh, using these isotopes and uh, their ingrowth rates in several different uh, elements uh, as, as proxies for what these processes would do chemically. Right. And we, we reveal those isotopic signatures with lasers sometimes. 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 Uh, mostly I, I use plasma or um, basically a light bulb style setup. Oh, no, yeah, that's right. So the, that thermal light. ionization. Thermal ionization. So we uh, completed that 50 meter jump. Would okay. you like to do another? Would you like to track uphill for a little bit? Uh, is the current going to let us track uphill? What do you think, Robert? Okay, I, I didn't quite catch that. You're not on SPL. Oh, you're mute and SPL. Uh, looks like it's coming from the northeast. So which way are we going? Um, north westish. Yeah. So so. Okay, so it's going to be a little lateral. Well, it'll be on the yeah, but it's not very bad right now. You can see it. Coming okay. By. Yeah, can we keep tracking uphill and uh, keep on the ridge? Sure. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Just broke through the uh, 1,700 meter mark as far as depth. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of uh, dead Walteria sponges here, which is pretty interesting among the the cobbles. Um, they actually look like they've fallen. Um, oh, and a small red uh, sea star. Yeah, right yeah. there. Just hanging Coming. out. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Do you think this is still some of the same sheet flow that's just broken um, up? These are looking a little bit more lobate. So, um, just slightly different flow style here. A lot of debris coming off them and downhill. Yeah, so one thing I'm, I'm uh, starting to do with science chat is every now and again just uh, put the put current herc depth in because that's uh, helping with uh, some of some of their observations too. Mm -hmm. there, there is the uh, in the same science portal you can go to the dashboard and Grafana to see yeah. the herc depth etc as well but and I, uh, I, fig I figure this helps a little bit because it keeps everything in one spot too. Is this uh, what is this? Is, is that, that another barnacle? Is that a stock or is that yeah I'm, I'm wondering if it's a barnacle or yeah, could we get um, a quick a zoom on that before or, or something else? Zoom if we're if we're here. Yeah, because I think we're waiting on a ship's move, so we may have a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh, looks like a barnacle. Yeah. A gooseneck. Yeah. Yeah, it looks that, like that another one. one. Uh, some hydroids too. Yeah. I was looking it up earlier trying to see um, what the different how you differentiate species of uh, Barnacles, and it's got to do with the plating as well as the size. And so, um, uh, you know, the apparently barnacles are made up of several plates, um, which is actually one of the reasons why they're within. Uh, they're actually arthropods, so they're in the yeah. same same sort of group as crabs. Um, and what you see, actually, you can see the um, their f it's their feet that are coming out. Um, okay. So they. Uh, didn't know yeah, that barnacles I think had they're feet. called Serapedia, Serapedia, Serap. Yeah, well, I mean, you would you you think like a lot of other things that those are like tentacle, like feeding tentacles, but barnacles, um, they actually like are kind of sitting on their heads when they're attached. Um, okay, everything I know about barnacles is wrong. <laughs> yes, yeah. So their infracrass class is Serapedia. Um, and um, yeah, they're uh, they're pretty interesting. Barnacles are absolutely wild, mm -hmm. truly wild crustacean. So um, yeah, and actually, that barnacle has a barnacle on it. <laughs> <laughs> barnacle inception. <laughs> Barnacleception. <laughs> we hear you like barnacles, so we put a barnacle on your barnacle.
All right, thanks for the zoom. Nice little uh, opportunity to learn about how completely wrong I've ever been about barnacles and that I'm going to have to do a little bit of reading this afternoon. Barnacles are um, fan favorites amongst biomimics, people who are looking for innovation inspired by nature because of their adhesion capabilities. Really? Yes, they've inspired actually several glues, especially medical glues. Really? Um, Oh, yeah, that's so rather than using a lot of toxic chemicals to, to make our glue products. Uh, or something that I'm hopefully not highly allergic to. Yeah, or something <laughs> you're not allergic to, but uh, but asking the barnacles for mm -hmm. uh, for advice. You can learn more about that on asknature.org. Nice. Asknature.org is a great site. If you yeah. haven't seen it before, you'll love it. I would I would appreciate a scopolamine oh, wow, patch. Oh, beautiful. That it does not have acrylates. As well as a wall like all those crinoids on that um, Walteria sponge is so beautiful. Oh, and it looks like we've got another Stichopathies um, unbranched uh, black coral and some another primnoid with a crinoid on it as well. Yes. Nice. Oh, and there's a shrimp next to the dead Walteria sponge. This is pretty amazing. Oh, we might have another one of those. Yeah, we're still in there. Yeah, they're all over the place. Yep. More mm. of those yellow stolen, and then that's, uh, yeah, not sure if that's a barnacle or one of those five like, valves that we I saw yesterday. I see yesterday. some stringers attached to that. Interesting. There there are, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that's a, a beautiful black coral. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, we we're seeing more of those yellow stolen inference as well. And that does have the line connecting the stolen. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're finding out that those are actually pretty abundant on this seamount. Makes me happy. But uh, perhaps yeah. not so common elsewhere. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. We yeah. do, uh, speaking of the soliniferans and the sample we collected earlier, we had a question about when we surface with the samples, is there someone to check that protocol is being respected according to the permit? And on board with us, we do have Malia Evans um, supporting us as cultural resource manager um, oh, for Papahanaumokuakea and the entire team um, working hard together to make sure that we're always operating within those permits and, and within um, the cultural expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we're all pretty pretty committed to uh, uh, the terms of that permit. Yeah, so we, uh, we every single one of us has to read it before we leave we um, and we off. sign that we've read it. Um, and, and we we double check the details when we need to. Yeah. Yep. And the sampling protocol is only a small portion of it as well. There's there's a lot that goes a into that. that. It's yeah. And the the permit is one thing, and uh, Malia is another. We don't want to we don't want to get <laughs> scoldings from uh, from Malia. She's yeah. a wonderful resource and teacher. Kumu. Very um, very highly respected. Guide here. So she's she's wonderful. Doing an outstanding job. Yeah. Malia's on uh, the eight to Nope, we're on the 8 to 12. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Malia's on the 4 to 8 watch. Yeah. Um, we zoom in. Just automatically put her on the greatest watch of all time. Cause <laughs> Malia's awesome. <laughs> she is oh, pretty great. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. And uh, uh, for our audience, uh, we'll be uh, starting up on a watch change here over the next few minutes. Nice. Um, I think I hear the next watch uh, starting to trickle its way in. So, um, yep, we will leave you. We're going to go eat lunch, and then I'm going to go into the rock lab for a bit. Ooh. So, right. Yeah, I, I wasn't able to yesterday, so i got to get caught up a bit today. Nice. But we have some puhaku cut open, and yeah, uh, yeah if anybody's interested uh, in the ship, uh, definitely come down and take a look, and uh, yeah, we'll tell we'll some rock stories down in the lab. Cup coral and some some beautiful-looking primnoids with mm. some red paracorshi in the middle there, too. That's yeah, I was wondering. These are beautiful, and look at all those. Oh, it looks like a pictogonid maybe on that one as well. Another incredible, incredible dive, dive number yeah. seven. Another great watch with you all. Uh, this yes. is Daniel Kinzer, science communication fellow, and um, I'm uh, excited to keep exploring with you all. Stay tuned, Nautilus Live. Check out our resources online. Schedule a ship to shore. We'd love to talk with you from the studio. Yes. You can find out how to do that online. Appreciate you all. Mahalo.
How's it Mahalo going? nui. Ahui ho. Malama pono. Until we meet again, please take care. Mahalo. Have a great day. Uh, mahalo, everyone. Take care. All right. Come up for me, Jacob. Come right up, 10 meters up. Rabbit speed. Uh, give me a minute, man. So we got a couple turns in our tether we need to deal with here. Uh, you, uh, yeah, come right up tight, like 25 meters there. And then uh, you can do, uh, I think you're going to go counterclockwise there. To Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. We're just completing a shift change or a watch change. Um, so just stay tuned as um, we uh, make sure operations are good um, and we'll continue the chat in a few moments. Uh, we have some tether management to do here. It's gonna take a minute. Maybe we can get the audio levels adjusted and do introductions while we're waiting. Yeah, should be able to do that. Great, yeah. 
Um, so, welcome to uh, the 12 to 4 watch again. Thank you so much for joining and exploring with us. Uh, we have viewers from all over the world, the US, Japan, Canada, UK, Venezuela, Turkey, Netherlands, Ireland, Hungary, Finland, Denmark, and Australia. So, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll do some introductions so you can get to know the uh, team here for this watch. I'll go ahead and um, introduce myself. My name's Kara. I'm the Science Communication Fellow joining you on this watch. And my job here really is to help share some of the research that's going on and make sure this science is accessible for all our audiences tuning in. When I'm not here on the EV Nautilus, I work at the Guam Coral Reef Initiative as the Seagrass and Mangrove Conservation Coordinator. So, so great to be here with you in Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Okay, can and look up. hoping we'll see uh, lots of interesting observations today. I'll pass it off and, to uh, come down to my right, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Hans. Sure, I'm Hans van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. I'm assisting the watch as watch lead. I also operate the still no. camera. I push the button. Come back to your right. Upashna? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah, important, the still camera. So I'm Upashna Ganguly. I am from India and a deep sea biologist studying the evolution of uh, deep sea octocorals from, uh, at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Uh, and I'll pass it on to Dilara. Hello everyone, I'm Taylor Ann. I am the science manager and data logger on this watch. Um, I, when I'm not on the Nautilus, I'm a research assistant at UCLA and also a master's student at Cal State Northridge uh, studying microplastic pollution. So um, this is very different than, you know, what I've been seeing in the past few years with my um, relationship with OET, but we've been seeing a lot of good dives the last, how long have we been out here? <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks? A little more than two weeks. Two weeks. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Been some great dives. So yeah. hopefully we get to see some more of that today. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, in the um, back row. And we'll go ahead to the front row. Um, Mia, if you're available, do you mind sharing? Yep, I'm ready. Uh, hello, I'm Mia. I'm serving as the navigator on this watch. And when I'm not navigating here, when we're doing, uh, when we're transiting to our next site, I work as a C4 mapper to get data for our next ROV dive. Okay, we can uh, move the boat now if you want. Good morning, Dan in the Hercules seat. Good morning, yes, Jacob. Please. I'm from Ella Beach, Oahu, and I'm in the Atlanta seat. It's blessed to be here. Aloha, my name is Jaina Galvez. I am from Hilo, Hawaii, and I am in the video engineer seat today. Great. Thanks, everyone, for sharing. And um, we uh, all come from different backgrounds and have had different journeys on our way to the Nautilus. So if you'd like to learn more um, on nautiluslive.org, right under that live stream, uh, it shows the profiles of our different um, uh, team members. And you can click on each one and learn about different things like how they got their career started or know where they're from, their favorite creature or <laughs> memory. So um, there's lots of information there if you'd like to learn more. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And um, we'll have one more introduction in a second. Come down five, please. So Taylor Ann and, and, and Apashna, you, you know, Val pointed out the oxygen's saturation levels and the salinity changes they've seen on um, the Grafana screen. So um, it's really interesting. They've, there's quite a change they had a couple hours ago with um, less oxygen, uh, looks like less salinity, but I'm going to lose that screen here. I won't watch it. I'll be watching the still camera, but they probably pointed that out to you, the previous shift. That's an interesting sea star. That is interesting that there was uh, I have to align myself with the graph. Okay, practical salinity unit okay, time, so I think. Hot water temperature, O2 saturation. Mm. 
2100. Oh, that is interesting. That is very interesting that we saw such a such an increase in temperature and a drop in oxygen saturation given the depth we are in. Yes. Is there some current that flows through this area which is increasing warm water current that is increasing the uh, temperature so much? I, I don't know. I mean, that is a... We have to... We should go back and check the oceanographic processes and the profiles of this area, but I'm sure... But this is an interesting observation. Yep. Yeah, because there's salinity drops. So if the salinity drops, then... Oh. And the the temperature went up. It went up, yeah. And, and the dissolved oxygen dropped. Yeah. Roger. So it can be, but, but does it have a scale? How much the drop was on the uh, s practical salinity unit uh, profile? Yeah, I don't see that. No, yeah. So maybe there is a warm water current that's coming in, which has lower salinity because it's uh, I don't know, we have to, we need to check what is causing this, but that is definitely, and also it doesn't say the depth at which it happened, I think the x-axis is more time, yeah, the x-axis is time. Right. Yeah, I guess the temp is in Celsius, because yep. it has those, right, and then that's pro that's PSU. Yeah, the temperature is probably in Celsius, no, but I'm but I want to understand the change or the, the change in temperature or what the y-axis units are, like the grid lines. Oh, right, there's no... Yeah. Mm, no scale. Can you um, zoom on on each data point and it'll tell you, or...? So Sorry, I tuned out for a bit. What are you all looking for here? So there was apparently oh. a sharp change in... Increase in water temperature and drop in oxygen concentration. Oh, so it's 0 0.1 degree yes. C change? Okay. It's on these plots that are open here. Yeah, this is, this is also it's it. The same yeah, one. I'm trying yeah. to see if the scales are any different here for you. Um, so so us, if we zoom in, yeah. if we um, mouse over that particular point, okay. it will show us the number here. Okay, so, so that, that was 21. 2.1 degree 2 .1, C. Sorry. And then. Yeah, so I think actually this was only a 0.1 degree okay. change. Right. Okay. 34 and this is okay. Um, so if you pull up the actual this, this Grafana screen, you can see um, Herc's depth and Argus's depth changing as well with yeah. time. Yes, please. Um, in comparison. Which yep. not that I think that's just a magnified plot. It's 0.1 okay. degree change. Yeah, I so see. That's causing the quite magnified, but the yeah. Dissolved oxygen, 13.48% to 11.05%. That is probably related to the water movement. Oh, mm. uh, yeah. Oh, uh, they were tracking a line at 0.2. Interesting. Do we want this screen, this one, that screen? It's so always important to keep an eye on the water quality data as we... No, no, I can switch. Like, do, you want, do we want to put, uh, what is the screen called? I don't know. Yes. Now I'm saying that, do we want to put that on the upper monitor? Yes. So that, I mean, they can have a look at the bathymetry. You don't? Oh. Yeah, I think it's... Oh. I thought it's the same one. You can control. Yeah. Okay. You're basically viewing his screen. Yeah. Uh. And um, 